Vyasadeva saw the nature of the material world and then spoke the Bhagavatam to help people come out of the nature of the material world. So there he says how we all get into illusion and how we come out of illusion. And these four verses are told by Jiva Goswami to be like the conceptual basis of the Bhagavatam. So there is a, there is a conversi conversational basis of the Bhagavatam is the conversation between Shukadeva Goswami and Parikshit Maharaj. Then there is, a con there is a conceptual basis. The conceptual basis is this. In the chapters 4, 5 and 6, Vyasadeva is instructed by Shukadeva Goswami, by Narad Muni, his guru that meditate on the Supreme Lord, understand the essence of essential truths of life and present them. So those four verses present that essence. So what is that? I'll just briefly mention that essence and then I'll depict it through these figures. That first he says, Vyasadeva saw that Samyak Pranihite Amale, he saw everything clearly. So Apashitta Upashitam, he said that there is the Supreme Lord and under him there is Maya. There is God here and there under him is Maya. And under Maya is the Jiva. Yaya sammohita Jiva Atmanam Trigunatmakam Paropi Manute Nartham Tatkritam Cha Vipadyate So although if you consider this hierarchy, the Jiva is spiritual. This, we are souls, we are conscious beings, we are spiritual. So ideally we should be here with Krishna, not exactly equal to him. So, that, so we should be, Krishna is here, we should be here and material nature should be below. But currently the hierarchy has become like this. We have become controlled by material nature. And that is because of the desire to enjoy material nature. And then what is the solution to that? So, the, so in Sanskrit these three are often referred to by three terms called J. J is the Jagdish, Jiva and Jagat. Jagdish is the Supreme Lord. Jiva is the soul and Jagat is the universe. So essential ingredients of existence are these three. Jagdish, Jiva and Jagat. And Jagdish and Jiva are meant to be together. Then both are happy. But currently Jagdish has been put aside and the Jiva and the Jagat are together. When the Jiva and Jagat are together, the universe and the world and the soul when they come together, the soul becomes bound. And what is the solution? The Bhagavatam says that that Vyasadeva saw this and he spoke the Bhagavatam. Anartho pashamam sakshad bhakti yoga madhoksha jay lokasya jananto vidvam chakre satvata samhitam says the anartha that which binds this jiva to material nature that is anartha. To free the jiva from that the soul for, for that the Bhagavatam is spoken. Now, how does the Bhagavatam free the jiva, the soul? That is described in the last verse, in this four verse sequence. Yasyam vaishruyamanayam krishne paramapurushe bhaktirutpadyate pumsam shokamoha bhayapaha. If you just hear about Krishna, by hearing about him, what will happen? By hearing about him, attachment to him will develop. And so the soul is here, material nature is here, it's controlling the soul right now. But if the soul hears about Krishna, the soul will develop attachment to Krishna. And as the attachment develops, then the effect of material nature on the soul, and there are three broad effects, shoka, moha, bhaya, and lamentation about the past, fear about the future, and illusion about the present. These three effects will cease. That means the soul will come out of the control of material nature. So the topic I'll be speaking on today is that how we get entangled and how we can become disentangled. And for this, broadly, we will understand our own nature. We will understand the nature of the world. Then we will try to understand the nature of our own mind. And we will try to understand how bhakti can bhakti works with the nature of the world and work with the nature of the mind. So normally, we say the world is a place of illusion, maya. It's interesting, uh, there is a movie, movie trainers industry or an institution in America, it's called the American Institute of Illusion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there may be an American Institute of Illusion but the world, the material existence itself is like a universal institute of illusion. We are all an illusion in this world. So now when we say illusion, what does it mean? 
the sanskrit word maya does anyone know what it means maya yeah yeah ma yeah that which is not that means things are not the way they appear to be that is the essence of maya so the uh, the, ma now the nature of Maya we can talk in various ways but primarily I'll talk in terms of this simple diagram this is based on Bhagavad Gita 18.37 and 38 there Krishna says that the nature of pleasure there can be spiritual pleasure and there can be material pleasure or we could say there can be enlightened enjoyment there can be ignorant enjoyment and he says that the nature of higher happiness any kind of higher happiness is Yattadagre vishamiva parinam emritopamam tatsukham satvikam proktam atma buddhi prasadajam In 18.37 he says that which tastes like poison in the beginning will taste like nectar in the end. So this is the nature of pleasures that are evolved, that are higher pleasures. Say if you want to, if we go, want to learn a new language or if you want to learn a new skill we start as novices and it's not a good feeling to feel that I don't know anything but once we start learning there's a lot of application required but once we start learning then we get the joy of learning that subject mm -hmm. so there is pain initially but eventually once you've learned it there is pleasure so if somebody doesn't know driving and they want to learn driving they're always fearful what if I ram into someone what if things go out of control what if an accident happens but once they learn driving, then it's so smooth, they can go wherever they want. So there is poison in the beginning, but nectar at the end. So this is P and N. So this is, those of you from electronics, P and N might associate with diodes. <laughs> That's not diodes. <laughs> so it's P is poison and N is nectar. So this is based on 18.37. So we are talking about, when we say we are the soul, which is meant to be above material nature, is below material nature. So how does the soul come below that? How does the soul become bound and how we can, can become unbound? That's what we're going to talk today. So conversely, there's another kind of pleasure Krishna says that Vishayendriya Sanyoga Dhyattadagre Amritopamam Pariname Vishamiva Tatsukham Raja Samsmritam so, Vishayendriya Sanyoga The pleasure that comes by the contact of the senses with the sense objects that is materialistic pleasure, sensual pleasure. Krishna says the nature of that is it tastes like nectar in the beginning but it becomes like poison in the end so we could say suppose the example of drinking now when somebody is feeling uh, low or whatever they drink and they feel high they feel good but after that the next morning you know they get enlightenment <laughs> 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 Not enlightenment about <laughs> spiritual truths, but enlightenment about the consequences <laughs> of having drunk, like a rate of splitting headache and a hangover. So it said that first the drinker takes the drink, then the drink takes the drink, and then the drink takes the drinker. <laughs> so it becomes like a, cat, uh, a, a chain effect that keeps cascading bigger and bigger. So most pleasures in the world they look like nectar in the beginning. They appear very attractive. And that's how we get captivated by them. So the illusion of the world is that things are not the way they are. That which is troublesome appears enjoyable. And that which is actually enjoyable appears troublesome. And this is how we are put into illusion. This is how we are put into illusion. So this is the, so I am going to talk this in three parts. First is the nature of the outer world and second is, third, second is the nature of the inner world and third will be how bhakti helps us work with both. So this was the first part. The nature of the outer world is that things look attractive but they are not what they seem to be. So I would like some reflections as, uh, in between the class also. So if any of you have any comments, any points struck to you or any similar thoughts or any questions we can have a little break and you can ask them right now. If any of you have any. Any questions? Or reflections? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're saying that uh, basically that um, there's three 
factors in the equation. Yeah. There's Jagadish, who is the Supreme Court, and he's the controller of the Jagat. The material world. Yes. And then there's the Jiva. Yes. And then Jiva's become, the Jiva's at the bottom, but he's supposed to be in the middle. Yes, right. Thank you. Yeah, actually, it's basically this inversion happens because we become controlled by the things that we become attached to. So when we become attached to something, that thing controls us. And uh, so that's the first part. Thank you. Let's move on. Can you move to sec just press right click? Yeah. So now, oh, oh, oh. can you go to the next slide? One more? OK, go back. Mm, this is this crude. I didn't. Uh, I drew this just before a recent class that I gave. So now, let's see how this nature of the outer world reflects the nature of the inner world. Throughout history, people in different traditions have talked about how there seem to be multiple voices within us. One of the universal psychologists dis disagree about almost everything among themselves. They say, they say that normally say, you know, for everything there are two sides of the story. But in psychology, for everything there are three sides of a story. So there are a lot of different opinions people have of different things. But there's one thing almost all psychologists agree about is that we are not the masters of our own house. We are not the masters of our own house. That means inside us, there are forces that don't seem to be in our control. And those forces sometimes take over and make us do things that afterwards we ask ourselves, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Has anyone got this experience? You know, if anyone has not got the experience, why did I do that? And your pure devotees. Yeah. <laughs> this, we, I don't want to do this, but somehow I end up doing it. So, what, what is it? So, there is something inside us which seems to take control over the times. And so, we are not the masters of our own house. And there are different models to explain this. In the Native American tradition, they talk about how there are two dogs inside us, a good dog and a bad dog. Sigmund Freud talked about three, he talked about ID and superego. Yeah, different people have different models. So you could treat what the Bhagavad Gita is saying also as a model. Although the Bhagavad Gita is also telling us ontology, the nature of reality. But let's take this right now as a model to understand our inner world. So the Gita says that there are broadly not two voices, but there is there are Three, three factors which determine the choice within us. Now again, you could analyze this further, but for the sake of simplicity, I'm keeping it three. That there is the mind within us, there is the intelligence within us. And apart from both of these, there is we, the conscious being, the soul. So if the soul is above, now this, is, this hierarchy is, the earlier these two was based on 18.37 and 38 in the Bhagavad Gita. This is based on 3.41, 42 in the Bhagavad Gita. So what does Krishna say over here? Indriyani paranyahur, indriyebhya paramanaha, manasastu para buddhe, yo buddhe paratastu saha. So he says, indriyani, the senses are above matter. Indriyani paranyahur, what does that mean? The senses are above matter means, say if some, there's, there's some delicious gulab jamun. Hmm? The gulab jamun doesn't come walking to us. <laughs> you know, we walk to it. So the senses go toward the sense objects. In that sense, the senses have consciousness associated with them. The sense objects, broadly speaking, are made of matter. So now, the senses are above the sense objects. Then this above the senses is the mind. So we are putting all the senses in this category on the right. And there is a mind, above the mind is the intelligence. And above the intelligence is the soul proper. So these two forces, broadly speaking, the mind and the intelligence are inside us. 
that the word mind can have many different meanings will for uh, in our day to day conversation also are you out of your mind have you lost your mind now there what do we mean what what is the meaning of the word mind in that context judgment judgment intelligence what are you thinking about give this your full mind what does that mean attention, attention. give this your full mind mm -hmm. so einstein was one of the greatest minds of the 20th century what does mind mean over there thinker thinker uh, luminary intellectual luminary so the word mind can have different meanings and that's why we have to be careful when we use a word what meaning are we associating with it so the bhagavad gita uses the word mind to refer to the impulsive side within us the you could say the seat of emotions and not exactly the seat of emotions it is the place from which our short term emotions impulses and desires uh, they are accumulated and they emerge from there so basically here in this analysis the word mind refers to that which is short term <coughs> short term desires impulses urges emotions all of that in contrast with that there is a intelligence which can think long term which can see the consequences of actions which is mature so one way to understand this is that inside each one of us is a child is a infant and an adult and so the infant within us is like the mind the adult within us is like the intelligence and the infant and the adult both ideally speaking the adult should control the infant but sometimes the infant controls the adult you know it sometimes it happens that the the parents should be able to discipline the child but the children control the parents and then that is uh, that is not a very congenial situation for either the children control the parents so uh, within us we could say the mind is like the infant the intelligence is like the adult and we are the soul so now the soul is the conscious observer and the soul has to choose whom they listen to whom they listen to the soul listen to the mind or to the intelligence so in the hierarchy things should be like the soul is above the intelligence is below the mind is below that and the mind is what is connected with the outer world so the mind is what perceives the outer world and gives the information to the soul so this is a this is the inner world in terms of the hierarchy that there is the mind the intelligence and the soul this is hierarchy any questions about this till now now let's see how this hierarchy functions can you go to the next slide so ideally how should it function the consciousness comes from the soul through the intelligence to the mind and then looks at the things as they are now if the intelligence is in control of the mind see the mind is itself not a bad thing the mind is functionally essential for us the mind is what links us with the outer world so the mind is needed but who is in control if the intelligence is in control of the mind then when we look at the outer world we look to see long term things so when the intelligence is control and then the mind is subordinate to that then when we look at the outer world we see okay this looks like poison but there is nectar over there when you look at something and like say suppose we want to do we want to maintain good health and we want to do a workout now the first thing is it's so tiring it's so exhausting it's such a headache i don't want to do it so now that initial if you look at it you know if you think of the weight i have to lift the exercises i have to do that is the poison in the beginning i don't want to do but if i actually get up and start doing things and i start feeling healthier i start feeling my body becoming more uh, smoother to function then that is the nectar so when the intelligence is in control 
we see beyond the initial to the eventual. We see beyond the initial to the eventual. But when the, so this, this applies to both the higher joys where we have to go through the poison to get to the nectar. And it applies also to the lower pleasures that tempt us. Oh, there is this nectar over here, but there is poison afterwards. There is nectar here, there is poison afterwards. So I don't want to get involved in it. So the intelligence sees the consequences. And thereby, we can act maturely. Although the world is deceptive, and the world's deceptiveness is not going to change. But if we are perceptive, that means the intelligence and the control of the mind, then we will be able to see the eventual results and act accordingly. We will choose the consequences. However, something else happens. Can you go to the next slide? This is the second hierarchy. So if you see over here, the other line you see, from the line goes from the mind, no, from the soul to the mind, and from the mind to the intelligence, and from the intelligence it goes, it sees only the initial poison. Or you can see the same line going down here, it sees only the initial nectar. So when the mind becomes in control of the intelligence, that time, it's not that the intelligence is lost, it is controlled. And when that happens, then we see only the initials. Oh, this is so troublesome, forget it. If anything that requires exercise, application, dedication, forget it. I can't do it. And we see this in so many aspects in today's world. Now, we could, if we talk about relationships, every relationship requires commitment. But that commitment appears to be like poison. But if there is no commitment, then the end result is that there is complete isolation, loneliness, disconnectedness completely. So, there is poison in the beginning, there is nectar in the end. But the mind, when the mind becomes in control, it uses the intelligence, but it uses the intelligence to justify its obsession with the initials. So, you, you know, facts in some ways are value neutral. The same fact can be interpreted in many different ways. So, we may say, life is temporary. Don't waste your life in temporary pleasures. Seek the eternal. I saw, I was in Kal Kolkata and I saw advertisement. He says, life is temporary. Enjoy before you become a dirty old guy. <laughs> so now, the fact is the same. Life is temporary. But depending on what is in control, is it the mind or is it the intelligence? That fact will be interpreted differently. So the nature of our inner world is that the mind will always look at the initials. Hey, this is so difficult, forget it. This is so enjoyable, why should I not enjoy it? And thus, we get bound. So now, with the internet available, there are so, much, so many things that are promised free. Isn't it? You can watch this movie free, you can read oh, free, you can watch this novel free, you can read this novel free, you can see this image is free. See, now, whenever any product is promised as free, what it means is that it is we who are the product. Mm -hmm. It is we who are being targeted. What happens is, it may be offered as free, but then our consciousness gets attached to it. And as we get attached to it, we want it more and more and more and more. And then we get consumed by it. So when something seems free, it seems, oh, it's only nectar, there's no poison there. Mm. It's only nectar, it's just free. Mm. It is free, but it is not free. Mm. It is free, okay, even if it appears free to enjoy right now, it won't leave us free. Because it will, it will captivate our mind. It will form impressions. This is very significant that for the mind, uh, through any sensory pathway, impressions can be formed. And say, suppose somebody takes a drink, somebody drinks, takes alcohol or drugs or whatever. Now we understand that taking drinks is habit forming. But how are habits formed? We could say the brain gets rewired in a particular way. So somebody is an addict, then their brain neural pathways 
have become rewired in such a way that that behavior becomes almost default behavior for them. That could be the neuroscience explanation. If you want to go into psychological explanation, you can say that the, at the level of the mind, certain impressions are formed. And once those impressions are formed, then that behavior becomes almost like the default behavior. So for the mind, for the impressions to be formed or for the brain, for its neural pathways to get rewired, all senses are more or less equal. That means normally if you are going to say put something into physically into our body, if you are going to take some drugs or if you take to some alcohol, it will be a little serious, you know, I don't want this to go into my body, it will damage my body. But for the mind, what we take in through our mouth or our skin is just as consequential as what we take in through our eyes. Now, if we take something in through our eyes, that can also rewire our brain. That can also form impressions in the mind. And those impressions will start coming as propositions. Do this, do this, do this, do this. So, if you see this particular thing, that the mind is looking only at the initials, either the poison or the nectar. Now, this is at one level a conscious choice. At another level, it is a default disposition. So, to the extent something becomes an impression, to the extent something becomes a habit, to that extent, one just can't see the other side. So, if somebody has become an alcoholic, or somebody has become a drug addict, or whatever, now once they get habituated to that, no matter how much they try, just can't think about the other thing. This has this consequence. They know it, but it doesn't register within them. Once there was an anti-alcohol campaigner, and he said that, I'm going to give a fiery talk about how alcohol is so dangerous, alcoholism is so dangerous. I said, I'll give you a demonstration. And then he had a small box in which he had put a fly, and there's a bottle of alcohol. So he took the fly out from that box and threw it into a bottle of alcohol. The fly fluttered a little bit and then went down, dead. Then he turned around and all the people said, so what do you learn from this? And everybody started looking at him. Oh, no. There's one person who was very cheerful. He said, what do you learn from it? He says, what do you learn? He says, when I drink alcohol, all the germs in my stomach will die. <laughs> <laughs> So what has happened over here, <laughs> the mind has taken control of the intelligence so much that even if you see the poison, you don't see the poison. So it's in Sanskrit, it says pashyan api na pashyati. We see, but we don't see. So that's what happens when we become conditioned to a particular way of behaving. Although we know about all the consequences, but when we really have to act, our vision doesn't go in that direction. Our vision goes in some other direction. So this is the nature of our inner world. That in our inner world there is the mind and the intelligence. And ideally speaking, the mind should be controlled by the intelligence. And then we perceive the outer world. But quite often the mind controls the intelligence. And when the mind controls the intelligence, then we start perceiving the outer world in an unhealthy way. In a way the, uh, which ends up deceiving us. So the world is deceptive, but we can be perceptive. However, if both the outer world is deceptive and our inner world is also deceptive, because in our inner world also the impressions are such that we start seeing only the deception of the world or we start getting deceived by the world. That's what we see. Then we are badly trapped. So when he says that the jiva, although jiva is meant to be above, Maya about the world, but Jiva has gone below the world. That's because of this hierarchy inversion. That instead of the intelligence being in control of the mind, when the mind comes in control of the intelligence, then the soul gets subordinated, gets conquered, gets controlled by material nature. Any questions or comments till now? Yes, ma'am. What's the role of false ego? So whenever I read or heard about mind intelligence, so false ego, so is there? Um, okay.
Okay. That's part one and part two. Maybe it's saying, what's the default mind becomes the default that mind takes over, or intelligence is the default, and then so and how does the default change? Is it the false ego that takes the shift? Okay. It's a good question. So, is it what, what exactly is the false ego? See, as I said, ultimately this is all a matter of terminology. How we want to look at certain terms, it, that will determine what we are looking at. In a sense, if you consider a computer system, a soft, I say in the computer system there is software. Now, in the software, you could have the operating system, you could have some pre installed apps. We could have some user installed apps. Now, now the, in terms of content, all of them are simply codes. In terms of content, it's just 101010, a combination of codes. In terms of effect, in terms of function, they are different. So, similarly, if you look at the characteristics of material nature that are described in the third canto in Kapila's teachings. He describes mind, intelligence and ego in functional terms, not structural terms. This is structurally, the operating system, the pre-installed apps, the user installed apps, all three are the same. Functionally, they work differently. So similarly, the ego, the intelligence and the mind, they are structurally the same. They are all made of subtle matter. It's functionally, they all have their different tools. Uh, so now with respect to the functionality, the, now each of these at one level is essential. The mind is essential, the intelligence is essential, the ego is also essential. As long as we are in a particular body, we need to identify with that body. We don't need to completely identify with the body so that we forget our spiritual identity. But you know, if I have the body of a, of a Brahmana, means I have a more body that is suited for intellectual work and I think I am a Kshatriya and I start fighting, I will get beaten up. So I need to understand which body I have and how to function accordingly. So at a functional level identification is required with the body. So the ego is that mechanism, you could say ego is like the operating system. Without the operating system nothing can function. So the ego is the basic operating system for the soul to function in the environment of the material world. Mm -hmm. And the false ego is where, so ego is when the soul identifies with the body. False ego is when the ego, the soul identifies only with the body and forgets all identity. We need some level of identification. I am a soul and I have this body. This is the body which I am going to function right now. So, the false ego we could say is the fundamental basis by which the identification happens, this identification happens. But for the sake of simplicity, in this model I have, I base this model on 3.41 in the Bhagavad Gita. There Krishna leaves out the ego. That's why I, because if you bring in the ego, how it would be like, the ego is like a wall, which would be between the mind and the intelligence, like a, a draw a line, not like between the, sorry, between the soul, intelligence and mind, like that. So it will be like a layer in between and it comes through and filters. So, so Prabhupada used the example that say when we are in a human body, we have a certain kind of default instincts. Say, but somebody is in a dog's body or animal's body, uh, they have default instincts, they are different entirely. Now when the dog see when say a deer sees a predator, a lion, the deer doesn't even think, immediately runs. So that is that is default intelligence. So there is a certain level of intelligence which we don't even think about. So all that comes because the soul is identifying with that body. So the false ego would complicate the discussion, that's why I've not got into it here. But it is true that as we become purified by the practice of bhakti, then our identification with the body decreases. Our identification with the body decreases. And then we can pursue things more clearly. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. 
So let's move on now to the la uh, to the third part. The first part was the nature of the outer world. The second part was the nature of the inner world, and how that deludes us. The third part would be about how bhakti helps us to uh, function with the nature, which is the inner world and the outer world. Now, bhakti can be understood at different levels. Some people think of bhakti simply as emotion. Oh, I love Krishna. That is the emotion. Yes, it's true. But bhakti is not just a sentiment. Bhakti is a whole process, culture and way of living by which that emotion will be nourished. And thus, so at one level you could say the soul is there and we could put Krishna above there uh, transcendentally. And as a soul and Krishna, their bonding is bhakti. And that's what exists at the spiritual level, completely. That we don't have a material body, we don't have a material mind. There's no temptation. The natural the soul is attracted to Krishna. But presently, we are in the material world. And being in the material world, we need to function in a way that protects us from the illusions of the outer world and the inner world. So what does bhakti do? How, how does bhakti protect us? Now, the bhakti culture is, there could be again external aspects to it, internal aspects to it. So the external aspects of it is that in the bhakti culture, we create at one level such a pleasant atmosphere of devotional practice that the poison doesn't feel that much. Just like say if you are fasting on a particular day. Now fasting is difficult. But if you come together with devotees and then say it's a festival and we are chanting, we are hearing, we are deserving Krishna and we are absorbed in that. Then, the, the pain of the fasting doesn't seem to be that much. It's, you know, generally, fasting is difficult, but fasting becomes even more difficult when we start thinking I'm fasting. <laughs> if I forget that I'm fasting, then I won't feel that much pain. So, the whole art of bhakti culture is that when somebody wants to do something higher, then there is going to be a poison but we minimize that poison. So when we come to the temple, now to some extent, uh, a temple is a place where we want to have spiritual practices, we want to experience something spiritual that requires some amount of discipline and some amount of dedication. But Prabhupada says that the deity should be decorated so beautifully that when people come to the temple, they see the deity, oh, it's so beautiful. Just by seeing the deities, they start feeling some peace. They start feeling some peace. So the poison will be there, no doubt. But we try to help each other minimize the poison. So we help each other have the support systems by which either we minimize the poison or we help, we highlight the nectar. Say for example, if we are studying the Bhagavad Gita, now we may feel oh, Bhagavad Gita is such a philosophical book, so complicated. I don't feel like studying it. I just want to read some stories. It's good to read the Lord's past tense also. But suppose we associate with someone who is, loves the Bhagavad Gita. Now they are, they ex give so many fresh insights from the Gita and they are enlivened by studying the Gita. I say, oh really? All this is there in this book? I also want to see. So when we see, oh there is this nectar and somebody is experiencing this nectar. And although the poison is there, there is nectar beyond it. So that's why if we come in a devotee environment where, where the practices of bhakti, practitioners of bhakti yoga are joyful in practicing bhakti. Then, even if there is austerity, there is, we pass through that. We pass through that and go towards the nectar. We see, okay, if this, first of all, we help people to decrease the poison and secondly, we help them know there is nectar beyond the poison. So just persevere, just be patient. So, Prabhupada said, chant Hare Krishna, and what? And be happy. Now, is this one instruction or two instructions? <laughs> what do you think? It's one. <laughs> <laughs> so, somebody says, chant Hare Krishna and be happy. But many people may say, I'm chanting Hare Krishna, I'm not becoming happy. <laughs> <laughs> then what do you do? So, there's a beautiful verse in the 
uh, second canto of Shrimad Bhagavatam 1 to 22, which says, Atavai kavayo nityam bhak, bhaktim paramaya muda vasudeve bhagwati kurvantyatma prasadinim. Atavai kavayo nityam. Therefore, the wise people, they atavai kavayo nityam bhaktim paramaya muda, they practice bhakti very joyfully. Unto whom? Vasudeve Bhagavati. Unto the Lord Vasudeve. What is the characteristic about him? Vasudeve Bhakti. Kurvanti Atma Prasadinim. That which gives joy to the soul. Now, this is a little paradoxical wording. Can just go back up again once again. What it says is, therefore, the Kavaya, the wise people, joyfully practice the process that gives joy to the soul. So, bhaktim paramayamuda, they joyfully practice the process that kurvanti atma prasadhanim, that gives joy to the soul. So then, is it that joy is the ingredient of the practice or is joy the fruit of the practice? They are saying both. So how does it work like that, both? What it means is, say somebody has been sick for a very long time. They tried many, many treatments. You know, suppose you are sick and you go, go to a doctor. Now the last thing you want to hear, unless you have a very big false ego, the hmm. last thing you want to hear is the doctor saying, I have never heard of anyone symptom with symptoms like this. Hmm. And the false ego might feel very good, <laughs> but you know, if, I, if nobody has heard about it, <laughs> then how, how will I be treated? <laughs> so, I was uh, about, 10, about 15, 17 years ago, I, had, I was sick for many, many months. And nobody could detect what was the problem. You know, I went to so many doctors. Finally, I went to a doctor and the doctor, he did some tests and he said, P-U-O. I said, oh, at last, I found it. He said, I said, what is P-U-O? I thought by that time, I had got reasonable amount of medical general knowledge. But I had never heard of a disease called P-U-O. I thought, what is this? What is the diagnosis? The doctor said, no, there's no diagnosis. He said, no, but he wrote P-U-O. He says, P-U-O means pyroxia of unknown origin. <laughs> So pyroxia is fever <laughs> and fever caused by unknown factors that I also know. <laughs> so anyway, finally after a long time, uh, after almost 8-9 months I was suffering and finally the doctor diagnosed and they found that they did some exam they found I have got TB and I went to the doctor and the doctor said very gravely, he said you have got TB. He said thank God. <laughs> And the doctor looked at me as if I was crazy. <laughs> so now, if you have been sick, being sick is painful, but at least being diagnosed, okay, this is, the di this is the disease, this is the treatment. That is a relief. So, till now, the, we have not been relieved of the disease, but at least we have become relieved of the ignorance of what the problem is, and the ignorance about what to do about the problems. So similarly, this verse, what it says is, that joy, the, the wise people joyfully practice the process that brings joy. What that means is that they may not be experiencing the joy of bhakti. They may not have, can you go to the other diagram? They, are not, they may not be experiencing the nectar till now. But they understand, yeah, because of a disease, presently I am going through the poison, the nectar will come. So chant Hare Krishna and be happy. It's both a causal and a parallel instruction. Causal means, if we chant Hare Krishna, if we become conscious of Krishna, gradually, as our consciousness connects with Krishna, joy will come. But till that time, we can be happy that at least we are on the path to happiness. We can be happy that we at least know what is wrong with us and how, that we are on, we are following a process that will set things right. So one aspect of bhakti, bhakti culture at an external level is to minimize the poison to help each other see beyond the poison to the nectar so that even if it is difficult we can persevere and conversely in the bhakti culture we try to not highlight the nectar so much we highlight the poison now that means what the whole world tells us that oh there is so much enjoyment Buy this, eat this, touch this, watch this, you will enjoy. You will enjoy. We come to 
philosophy, we come to the Bhagavad Gita class and Bhagavad Gita says, Dukha Vale Mashavashwata. <laughs> this world is a place of misery. Yes. It can seem so pessimistic. Yes, what is this? Why, why is this world is a place of misery? Why do you have to be so gloomy? It's not being gloomy. It's like say, suppose this is a bottle of, this is a bottle now. This is, and now, suppose this bottle were empty. And I need some water. And I request, can you please get some water? And this, he says, why are you so pessimistic? So what do you mean? Just think that the water is full, bottle is full. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to think that an empty bottle is full, that is not optimism. That is stupidism. <laughs> <laughs> so, now what would be pessimism to say that empty bottle is empty is not pessimism. What would be pessimism is this bottle is empty and it is never going to be filled. This, you, are going to, you are thirsty, there is no water and you are going to die of thirst. That would be pessimistic, isn't it? But to recognize that the bottle is empty, then that we can take the step to fill it. So when the Bhagavad Gita tells us that this world is Dukhalaya, its purpose is not to say that this world is a place of misery, so stay miserable. That is not the idea of the Bhagavad Gita. It is just making us alert to the nature of reality. And it is also giving us a process to rise beyond that reality. So when we are told that this world is a place of distress, what it essentially means is that don't don't have unrealistic expectations about life and the world. More often than not, it is the search for happiness that is the cause of the greatest unhappiness. I repeat, the search for happiness is often the cause of the greatest unhappiness. And we see this, one of the most graphic examples of this could be addiction. You know, nobody is, say, born with a cigarette from their mother's womb. Is it? And if somebody starts smoking, they smoke because they want some pleasure. It's a search for happiness. But then what happens? You know, they take in the smoke and the smoke takes away their lungs. And then they suffer so much afterwards. So when the Bhagavad Gita is telling us that this world is a place of distress, it, is, it doesn't mean to say that, oh, be pessimistic, live a distressful life. That's not the point. That don't have unrealistic expectations about happiness in the world. So what seems like happiness will become the cause of unhappiness. So when I say the search for happiness is often the cause of the greatest unhappiness. What that means is, there is nectar and we start searching for that. But in searching for the nectar, we end up with the poison. The search for happiness is often the cause of the greatest unhappiness. So we need, so the, the bhakti culture does both these things. At one level, it helps us minimize the poison in enlightened joys. And it makes us aware of the poison in sensual pleasures, in worldly pleasures. So that we don't get unnecessarily entangled. And this is all vital. So in bhakti culture, say when we, we dress ourselves in a chaste way, in a decent way. Why is that? Because we don't want to allure each other. We, do, we want... Not that we, want to, we don't want to highlight the nectar and then the poison will follow. So the world today is such that it's almost the advertisement is it shows only the nectar and no poison at all. So the advertisement is like the advertisements of today's world are like they pr promise a product as they exhibit the product as if it is free and then they extort the price after that. So that is the culture that we live in. And bhakti culture is meant to help us understand and analyze the and understand so that we can act properly. We don't get carried away by the nature of the world. Just because we become devotees, the nature of the world is not going to change. The nature of the outer pleasures is still going to be the same. But we can become equipped to see the eventuals and we can help each other to see the eventuals. That's why uh, you know, we need to have strong association. A strong association, what does it mean? It doesn't mean that you know, when we come in association, somebody hugs us strongly. <laughs> well, that could be one aspect. But strong association means that even if somebody speaks strongly to us, 
we don't reject the association and go away. Now that doesn't mean, that doesn't give all of us a license to speak strongly to each other. <laughs> there has to be a proper relationship within which to do that. But suppose sometimes we are getting carried away by the nectar of something. And then as you're getting carried away by the nectar and somebody points out the poison to us, then we shouldn't think that they are, they are our enemies. Or they are, why are they doing this to me? They're not like doing like that to us, they're doing like that for us. So when somebody is cautioning us about the poison, they are our friends, not our enemies. If we stay obsessed with the nectar, we think, you know, why is this person against my enjoying? I was at an interfaith conference and we were talking about how young people can be attracted towards religion and spirituality. So the Christian pastor was telling that they did a survey among the youth about what is your conception, what is their conception about a priest? So who is a priest? So I said, there was young, one young man, he said, a priest is someone who is constantly worried that someone somewhere is having some fun. <laughs> <laughs> so people think that, anybody, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, you're telling us so many rules. So it's very, one of Srila Prabhupada, you know, he gave a, I was talking with one of Srila Prabhupada's senior disciples and he was telling that when he started, he was doing college outreach, Prabhupada told him that the worst thing you can do when you are doing college outreach is present Krishna consciousness as a set of rules. He said, first give an explanation of the philosophy, then tell the rules. So explanation of the philosophy means we explain how this nectar will lead to the poison. See, if somebody is only seeing the nectar and we say, don't do this, then they will think, you are just a killjoy. You are not allowing me to enjoy life. But if we explain philosophically how the nectar leads to the poison, then the rules start making sense. Then you see the rules are actually protecting us from the poison. See, if our vision is caught with the nectar, then we feel the rules are depriving me of the nectar. But if we are seeing the poison, then we see the rules are protecting me from the poison. Most people cannot see the poison at all. And the world systematically denies the reality of the poison. It is there, but it is just pushed away into the background. So for us, not in a judgmental, condemning way, but in an objective, rational, educational way, we show that this action will lead to this consequence. This nectar is followed by this poison. And then we see the rules as our protectors, as our friends. So we need to have this kind of education. So the devotee association can provide us support by which we can go beyond the poison to the nectar for higher joys. And the devotee association can help us to resist the initial nectar and see the eventual poison. This is with respect to the external aspect. How the bhakti culture and the bhakti, uh, bhakti culture means say we come to a temple, we do bhakti and say we are hearing classes now. So all this helps us to, you could say, deconstruct the nature of the outer world. Any questions about this? Yes, please. Um, what would you say to someone who, uh, who questions whether nectar necessarily leads to poison. For example, uh, not everyone who drinks mm. even a lot becomes an alcoholic or yeah. gets liver damage. Yeah, it's true. Uh, That's true. It's a good question. It's a common philosophy nowadays that you drink but don't become a drunk. So there's a drink with moderation. Everything with moderation is good. Now, I would say there are three broad ways of addressing this. So in principle, it's possible. And somehow, I think there's a whole book written on this topic. The taste of wine is the proof that God loves us. Oh. <laughs> wine is so delicious. How could something so delicious exist if God did not exist? So people think that this is so enjoyable. And so in certain cultures, that might just be a part of the culture itself. So you could say in principle that it could be possible that somebody can eat moderate, can drink moderately and no effect on them. It's possible. 
but it is there is always the danger over there it's like you are going to the edge of a cliff say okay go to the edge of the cliff you will peer down but don't fall down yeah you may not fall down but what if you do the risk is always there and when when somebody say somebody drinks but doesn't become a drunk then see generally when people go over to addiction of any kind it is not just one cause say for example somebody takes drugs mm -hmm. and now you may say if somebody takes drugs you take drugs once you will get an addict but it's not like that suppose say if you fall down somebody falls down and breaks their thigh now generally during their surgery and the treatment you're given steroids they are also kind of drugs now is it that everybody who goes through a thigh surgery becomes a drug addict after that no so now what happens exactly is that when we take something at that time when somebody is taking this drugs it's primarily to relieve the pain associated with that particular fracture and the healing of surgery over there so generally every unhealthy desire is a distorted expression of a healthy need every unhealthy desire is a distorted expression of a healthy need so if somebody is drinking why are they drinking some people they might just be social drinkers everybody drinks so i don't want to be the odd person out so let me drink now tomorrow if their social circle changes and their social circle nobody drinks they stop drinking because they were drinking just because they wanted a sense of belonging and acceptance but some people may drink as a escape way from life's problems so they are just oh life is so trouble i just want to escape from it and if that is the reason why they are drinking then even if they change their social circle still they may keep drinking because that has become their default escape way unless they find a healthier way to get relief from life's troubles life will always keep troubling us intermittently and when it troubles us we need some relief so when if that has become their default way of seeking relief then they will gravitate toward it and once they start seeking alcohol as a way to heal life's wounds then depending on how much wounded they are and how much they seek that relief they may get more and more entangled in it so you so i'm just giving two broad possibilities social drinking and say as a escape way now the same person from here may go over there by habit okay i, I drink only in moderation the last 30 years i have never become a drunk all the drunk i have i have drink regularly but i never become a drunk that's true but it till now it might just have been a social habit but tomorrow it might become a escape way and once it become a escape way it can lead to a it can become a you could say express way to addiction so that's why there is always the danger so if some it's, it's definitely possible that somebody can do some unhealthy things and not get entangled that's largely because maybe the other aspects of their life are reasonably functional and stable but if the other lives or parts of their life also get disrupted then they might see you start using this as a escape way and the last point is that now our consequences the consequences of our actions don't always hit us immediately that doesn't mean the consequences are not there is how is it normally we think of the law of karma as there's action and there is a reaction that is true but it's not just that, it's not that simple because if we have done some good karma in the past then even if we do some bad karma now because of that past good karma we we go through a buffer phase of pleasure and we don't experience anything negative because of that that means that say somebody might drink and they might not experience anything for years because by their past karma they are meant to be healthy it's like something with respect to eating also you could say if some people uh, they they just eat a little bit wrong their health gets spoiled it 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 they over it a little bit and their body balloons out and they get out of shape of course round is also a shape but 
<laughs> but <laughs> but some other people you know they they treat their tongue like a conveyor belt <laughs> they eat anything else and still this remains slim and fit now how is that happening <laughs> so it's that some so that means the way they are eating may not have immediate consequences that doesn't mean the consequence is not there so sometimes our present karma may not lead to a present reaction if we have a buffer of good karma so if somebody is drinking and not getting the consequences that simply means they have a buffer of good karma okay thank you okay so i'll move on to the last point and then we can have some questions further if we have some time so now i talk about how bhakti helps us to deal with the nature of the outer world and then we'll talk about how bhakti helps us to deal with the nature of the inner world in some ways what is both are related but there's a subtle difference in emphasis so in our inner world there's the mind and the intelligence and the bhakti it is at one level i started some people think of bhakti as emotion it is emotion but it is not just any emotion that we are experiencing any time bhakti is pure emotion it is the pure attraction of the soul towards krishna so most often on the spiritual path emotion is thought of as an enemy you know because emotion deludes us say we get attracted to someone and then we get attracted to someone and we just lose all intelligence or we get captivated by something say somebody takes some somebody takes some drugs or some alcohol they feel high they feel so good about it so often emotion is seen as the enemy of enlightenment enemy emotion is seen as the uh, as the enemy of higher knowledge and higher perception and to some extent it is true but what the path of bhakti does is that it doesn't reduce emotion to just one thing there are some emotions which are good and some emotions which are bad the, what does it mean some emotions are good and some are bad some of our emotions they drag us down and some emotions and lift us up in the ramayana there's a beautiful incident at when ram is in the forest at that time bharat comes over there the most of you know the broad story of the ramayana okay okay i'll mention it okay so basically in the ramayana ram is sent to the forest and he has his younger brother bharat who has a desire who wants his brother to come back and not be in exile but become the king now with ram is his younger brother lakshman and lakshman is like the quintessence of the modern angry young man <laughs> he is angry with everyone he is angry with his father he is angry with his stepmother he is angry with the citizens how dare ram be exiled like this so when now bharat because he is the younger brother he wants to beg his beg ram to come back so he thinks i am the younger brother my father my brother my older brother may not listen to me so he brings all the citizens he brings a major contingent of the army and he not all this many of the, all the courtiers and many of the citizens so it's like an army of thousands that comes over there now when lakshman sees this lakshman immediately gets angry <laughs> he says you know that the, the most dangerous jumping is jumping to conclusions <laughs> so he immediately jumps to the conclusion that this bharat is so wicked he is not satisfied having sent you to the forest now he has come with his whole army to kill you he says but he doesn't know i am here with my arrows he says today the earth will drink his blood <laughs> and drink the blood of anyone who dares to kill you dares to attack you so ram says cool down <laughs> so what happened he said Bharat's love for me is as much as your love for me. Has Bharat offended you in any way that you are so angry with him, or is it that in a burst of sentiment you came with the forest to the forest with me, but now the life in the forest is so austere that you are becoming irritable? If that is the case, now I'll ask Bharat to stay here, and you can go back and do the thing. <laughs> <laughs> lakshman becomes completely silenced by it and then after that when bharat actually comes and bharat begs ram please take the kingdom 
Now, normally, if a patriarch passes away, then there is the, the successors, the sons, the daughters, often they have a dis, uh, succession conflict, succession struggle. Who will get them? Here there was a succession struggle. But the succession struggle was not, I want the kingdom. They said, you take the kingdom. You take the kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> that was the struggle. And both of them saying, no, no, no. And then finally, uh, Bharat says, um, you will be the king even if you don't want to be physically there. So please give me your footwear. Please give me your sandals. I will put your shoes on the throne. And I will sit below that. He said, I want the position in the court to reflect the disposition of my heart. Mm -hmm. And now, then Ram gives his shoes, uh, his, his footwear to Bharat. Today, I say, if one brother gave his footwear, the other brother would take it and beat his brother. <laughs> like that. So, anyway, when uh, Bharat goes back with, with uh, taking those footwear on his head, Lakshman is very touched. And then Lakshman and Ram are sitting together. And at that time, Lakshman asks Ram, you know, like a younger brother, he says, Ram, why do I get angry so quickly? Because he's regretting all that he thought and spoke about Bharat. So Ram just pats him on the back and Ram says, you are sentimental. He says, are sentiments bad? He says, no. He says, sentiments are the ornaments of life. But we need to choose those sentiments that lift us up and avoid those that drag us down. We need to choose those sentiments that take us toward dharma. And we need to move away from the sentiments that take us away from dharma. So in sentiments, emotions, they're broadly the same thing. So it's not that all of them are bad, not that all of them are good. We have to see which emotion is taking me where. So if we come in front of the TTs and we feel an emotion, that is good. That emotion will lift us up. But if we see something sensual, and our emotion pulls us in that direction, that emotion is bad. So rather than seeing all emotion as uncritically good or as indiscriminately bad, Bhakti gives us a vision. Where is this emotion taking you? So the mind is not to be considered entirely bad. The impressions within the mind, some of them may be bad and we have to be guard against them. But some of them are good and we can use them. So what Bhakti does is, it makes emotion our ally, our friend, not our adversary. Certainly there are certain emotions which we need to control. But wherever the power of emotion can be channeled for our devotional growth. So anything in Bhakti that feels good to us. Say, if we like kirtans, if we feel peaceful, joyful when we hear kirtans, or if we have our some de favorite deity's picture, we keep that in front of us. And whenever we feel agitated, look at that. Or if we like to like a particular scripture, we like a particular passage from scripture, we like a particular speaker, we like a particular class, keep all those spiritual stimuli which evoke higher emotion within us, keep them ready with us. Rupa Goswami calls this as Uddipan. Uddipan is spiritual stimulus. Just as all of us have our particular sensual stimuli. So each of us may get agitated by certain things. Similarly, we may all get attracted by certain things. So Bhakti internally spiritualizes our emotions by giving us stimuli which can use our emotion, trigger our emotion to take us toward Krishna. All our emotions won't take us toward Krishna, but whichever emotions are taking us toward Krishna, we activate them more and more. We do our normal process sadhana bhakti, but we specially do those things which help us connect with Krishna. And that way, the mind, rather than taking us away towards illusion, the mind will take us toward Krishna also. And as far as the intelligence is concerned, in the inner world, we want the intelligence to be in control of the mind. But we don't want the mind to be constantly opposing and rebelling. The mind will oppose and rebel, but if there is something that we like also, not that we have to rationally think this is good for me, so I'll do it. Yes, that's good. But if there's something which you naturally like, then the mind's struggle will be lesser. Just like a parent cannot constantly control and discipline the child. The parent also has to engage the child in a way where the child starts cooperating gradually. So now with respect to the intelligence, the intelligence has to be nourished. And 
nourishing the intelligence this is related with the earlier point i talked about how we see not just the initial nectar but we see the eventual poison so when we come in the association of devotees what does nourishing the intelligence mean it doesn't mean necessarily that we have to memorize a lot of verses if we can that's good but sometimes now we are more concerned about how much the world knows that we know how much the world knows that we know so our spiritual knowledge is meant to make us devotionally fit not intellectually fat intellectually fat means that we become proud of our knowledge i know so much i know so much i know so much and yes it's good if we can know a lot but the important thing is that we become devotionally fit devotionally fit means our intelligence makes us inclined inspired to serve krishna at the end of the bhagavad gita krishna when he completes arjuna doesn't come to krishna and say great class <laughs> <laughs> what does arjuna say karishe vachanam tava i will do your will that means what has happened that intelligence has that is intelligence has been nourished but through the nourishment of the intelligence the desire to serve krishna has been stimulated within him and it is that desire to serve krishna that is what we desire so whether we have the intellectual capacity to memorize a lot of verses to analyze a lot of philosophy that we can try to do according to our capacity but if our intelligence we can direct in such a way that be here and street and remember so that we feel inspired to serve krishna then the intelligence will also become a, a capable of directing the mind along and bhakti when it connects when our bhakti nourishes our intelligence then our intelligence starts giving us the inner strength to push on so suppose we are, say we are chanting and if we just before chanting we have read something about the importance of the holy name we have heard something about the importance of chanting then we get more impetus i want to concentrate otherwise what is happening we it is we are chanting and our mind is wandering and the two are different channels so the mind is wandering the tongue is chanting and the soul is wondering which to do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the soul is wondering should i go along with the muttering of the tongue or go along with the wandering of the mind and and generally the wandering of the mind seems much more interesting <laughs> so if we have nourished our intelligence then we will feel inspired just like we do this nicely so this way when we nourish the intelligence the purpose of bhagavat shravan you know, this whole top that this, this program is called bhagavat shravan and the whole this section the last verse was that shruyamanayam when we hear hear about krishna atavai that shruyamanayam krishne param purushe then bhaktir utpadite pam sam that attraction to krishna will awaken and that attraction to krishna is the is the fruit of our spiritual practice that is life's greatest treasure that will fulfill perfectly our longing for pleasure in the eternal spiritual realm so i'll summarize i spoke today on this topic of understanding our outer and inner worlds and how bhakti helps us work with both so i talked about the nature of the uh, outer world i talked about these four verses from the bhagavatam which say that how what is the vyasadev saw in the mystical vision based on uh, this is the conceptual origin of the bhagavatam that the jagat jiva and jagdish so jagat jiva and jagdish the three units and this should be bottom up hierarchy but it has become upside down for the lower two that the lord is of course at the top but the soul has gone below matter because of the desire to enjoy matter so how can the soul come above matter by hearing about the lord and getting attached to the lord so how does the soul grow below matter that we discussed through some diagrams can you go back to the first diagram so i talked about bit is 18.37 38 how the initial play the world is deceptive maya means that which is not the things which are which appear pleasurable are actually troublesome and things which appear troublesome eventually end up being pleasurable so that is the nature of the world and that's how we get deceived and not only do we get deceived by the external but also by the internal you go ahead so there are 
all over the world, people have tried to understand the self by creating different models. Psychologists tell us that we are not the masters of our own house. So what are the voices that are going on inside that? We categorize them based on 3.41 in the Bhagavad Gita, 4041, that there is the mind and the intelligence. The mind is like the infant inside us and the adult and the, the mental is like the adult. So the infant will always show, see the short term, the impulsive, whereas the adult is meant to see the long term and act wisely. So then can you go ahead? So the normal way of functioning is that the intelligence controls the mind and then when we see the outer world, we see not just the initial nectar of worldly pleasures but we see their eventual poison and we don't see just the initial poison of the higher joys but we see their eventual nectar. But unfortunately the hierarchy gets inverted where the mind comes in control of the intelligence and then we get carried away by the initials and thus we <coughs> end up getting uh, staying away from spiritual things and getting uh, Addict, attached and addicted to worldly things. So how does Bhakti help us deal with this? Bhakti first of all, in the association of devotees, we make the initial poison more endurable and we make the eventual nectar more visible. If we see somebody absorbed in studying scripture, absorbed in chanting and relishing that, oh there is this nectar exists. If I go through this poison, I'll come to that. And then in the Bhakti culture, we try to minimize the initial poison, sorry, initial nectar of sensual pleasures and we highlight the poison. So when we talk that this world is a place of distress, that is not pessimistic, that is simply being realistic, that is educational. Not saying that you, this world is distressful and you stay distressful, but rather knowing that the world is distressful, don't have unrealistic expectations of happiness. The search for happiness can often become the cause of the greatest unhappiness. We chase after the nectar and end up with a lot of poison. And so this education and this encouragement that can help us navigate the nature of the outer world. And with respect to the inner world, Bhakti makes our emotion our ally, our partner in the devotional journey. Rather than thinking of all emotion as bad, all, all emotion as good, we select so the emotions that lift us up and we stay away from the emotions that drag us down. And we look for what is our Uddeepan, our particular spiritual stimulus, what connects us, what we like about in Krishna Bhakti and try to do that more and more. And Bhakti nourishes our intelligence by providing us a whole world view within which the ultimate purpose of life starts making sense. That means Bhakti provides us the our intelligence, the nourishment. The nourishment is not in terms of information, but it's in terms of determination. Our spiritual knowledge is not meant to make us intellectually fat, but to make us devotionally fit. So how much we know is not as important as how much what we know changes our desires. So instead of wanting to read a lot of books, we just focus on hearing something and getting inspired to serve Krishna. And if you do this, if we practice bhakti with this holistic understanding of how it works, then it can take us toward the ultimate joy. I talked about a chant Hare Krishna and be happy. It's not just a causal instruction, it's also a parallel instruction. Because we have been sick and finally we have known, we have come to know about the process of cure. So although we are not yet cured, we are happy that we are taking the cure. In this way, by practicing bhakti, we can be happy right now and we can proceed toward the ultimate happiness. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.